Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We really do have INE members from around the world here today, and thank you for taking time out uh, to talk with us. Um, to get started, um, as of the 22nd of March, um, INE has um, heard from UNESCO that um, there are now uh, 124, if not more, countries um, that have carried out countrywide school closures which is affecting over 1.25 billion learners uh, from pre-primary to tertiary education. We know that the impact is particularly complex in humanitarian settings. However, we also know that this humanitarian community uh, has many lessons to share with those now finding themselves in education and emergency settings for the first time. As you know, INEE is an open global network of 16,000 members and plus uh, from non-governmental organizations, the UN, donor agencies, governments, academic institutions, schools, and affected populations. All of us working together to ensure all persons the right to quality, relevant, and safe education in emergencies and post-crisis recovery. Here at the INE Secretariat, our priority is finding ways to support our education and emergencies colleagues as they now face these additional challenges. We are doing this in a very you know, few key ways, um, and this is one of them today. You will see here um, the online collection and Sarah Montgomery will discuss this in more detail. Uh, this, uh, this collection is where we are pulling together, curating, and disseminating key tools, resources that we hope will help our members. We are also supporting this with a series of blogs and webinars like this one so that we can share lessons learned and create a space to come together. Um, and finally, we're going to continue to keep engaged on all of the global discussions now happening and, and doing our best to get that information back to all of you. And finally, I just want to urge you to really take the time for self-care and well-being. We recognize that INE members are working in some of the most challenging contexts around the world, and that you and your teams and friends and family are now dealing with the increased pressures of this global pandemic. We know these are particularly stressful times. So we would urge all of you to stay safe, take care of yourselves as well as you can. Our individual, and collective well-being is so important at times like this, particularly when you are so focused on supporting others. Indeed, our next webinar will focus on education in emergency practitioner well-being, and we would urge you to really you know, pay attention to the website and the communications so that we can get that information to you very soon. Thank you to the INE Secretariat for all the work in pulling this together so quickly. Um, at this time, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Charlotte. And uh, again, and I'll just one final thank you to our panelists. Uh, we are, are really excited that they could join us so quickly uh, to share some of the key information that you'll hear today. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Dean. Um, so I think without further ado, we'll hand over to Sarah, Sarah Montgomery, who leads knowledge management here at INE and has um, been doing a lot of work to, to develop this collection. Um, which hopefully you're all familiar with. Um, and she's gonna give us an orientation to help us really navigate that collection. Um, so Sarah, are you okay, okay to, to jump in and take over? Natalie, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. <laughs> Great. All right, well, bear with me. I'm gonna be looking for Sarah's notes because I, um, I have some sense of the great work that she's put into curating this collection of resources, but probably not all the, the, the detailed process. So I'll be looking out for any advice, Sarah, that you have in the chat. Um, yeah, I think uh, what Sarah was getting to here is uh, the fact that luckily our, our new website was set up really well to begin to curate um, uh, submissions around this theme as it started to emerge several months ago. Um, but of course, as things have become more urgent on a global scale um, to, to start to really compile the most up-to-date information uh, at the top of this resource, which, uh, yeah, I think we're looking at the right slide to see that intro there. Um, but also, more importantly, the goal of this resource is really to, um, to, to gather the work that is already out there. We've chosen as INE to prioritize our members and, and acknowledge the great work that you have already put out into the world that could help us respond to this rather than starting to create unique um, standalone resources at this time. 
Uh, and I think we can click on to the next slide. Um, as with all of INE's resources, um, we, are, we are making this available in all five of our languages. We're really lucky at INE to have strong language communities around um, Arabic, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, as well as language community facilitators that support this work. Um, they are adding to those collections on an ongoing basis, um, helping with the reviewing um, and vetting process, and um, remain open to your submissions for any resources that might be helpful in any of these languages. I think we can head on to the next slide. Um, you'll see here, again, maybe this is uh, where my knowledge fails a little bit, but um, uh, again, our, our website is structured really, really nicely to be able to curate not just a broader collection on an emergent theme or topic that our members need, but also to, um, to point out sub-collections of resources that may be cut across the COVID-19 response as well as um, you'll see here kind of cross-sector guidance, really specific technical guidance. Um, and this sub-collection list is growing and growing. Again, I can't credit Sarah enough. I believe we had three sub-collections, uh, distance learning, PSS, SEL, um, and maybe one other protection, I think, at the beginning of this week. And now we have the mini that you see listed here. Um, so again, the, the navigation style, if you're, if you're looking for any uh, resources that have been submitted by INE members and that have been vetted by, by our staff and our membership to show you the best, um, best practice possible for any of these topics within the umbrella of the COVID-19 response, this is how you navigate there to these sub-collections. Um, and Sarah, yes, I'm, I'm seeing your chats. <laughs> Good. I hope I'm not uh, not blowing through too much of this uh, too lightly because again, it's been been a really great effort um, by 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 Sarah and by our members to to pull this together. Um, and I think we can click. Yeah, we're on to the the next slide. Um, I think the the other thing to know as you as you look at these resources, while they may look like um, yeah, just just a list of, of links for you right now. There are very much people behind them. Again, Sarah being the, the master there, but so many of our members, um, including uh, those near and dear to my heart, our standards and practice working group members are, are helping review and vet these resources. Again, our language community facilitators are there. Um, and within our secretariat, we do have a COVID-19 response team, a kind of smaller group of us that are responding to these requests um, uh, more specifically and, and devoting our time to this right now. So um, any any time you would like to suggest a resource, uh, please email that to our, um, our COVID-19 email address. Um, it's COVID-19 at INEE.org. Um, and there's a whole team of folks behind this that, that, that can help point you in the right direction if you're looking for something or, or um, get back to you to let you know how we'll plan to, to um, post that resource to our website. Um, and yeah, in the, in the interest of transparency and again, acknowledging that we are, we are pulling this all together because you have made it available. <laughs> Thank you so much for making your tools uh, globally accessible and, and free for all to use. Um, you can see some of the criteria we're using to, to curate this list. I think a, a big challenge has been that we're seeing um, lots of resources out there, and that's a wonderful thing, but, but we do want to be targeted and, and help point people in, in the right direction. Um, I think we can click on to the next slide, Hannah. Um, yeah, and, and to that end, uh, we, we have, rather than just emailing your resource as well, um, we now have a survey open that you are invited to please, please submit your resources um, for the EIE response around COVID-19. It's available in all five of our languages. We encourage you to share it widely with your networks. Um, it should only take you just a few minutes to fill out, um, but will be so useful for us in this uh, curation effort and what we've chosen to prioritize, which is taking from um, the real experts out there, our, our 16,000 member network, and um, showing you uh, what, what, what your peers are relying on right now. Um, this closes tomorrow uh, at midnight, um, and you should be able to find it in any of your INE listserv messages, or again, I think we are sharing around these resources 
after the webinar, so you'll be able to click straight through. Whew, um, Sarah, that was my best impression of you. I hope I haven't let you down horribly. Um, but that's actually the, the end of maybe the knowledge management portion of the webinar. Shar, did we want to stop for questions or comments along the way, or we're going to save for the end? Yeah, I think we might um, save till the end, Natalie, and, and see if we can get Sarah online and to respond to any of those questions. But thanks so much for stepping in. And as someone kindly said in the in the comments, we're all adjusting to this sort of new <laughs> way of working. So thanks for your patience, everyone. And thanks, Natalie, for stepping in. I think just to say that, yes, we're, re you know, responding quickly as we can. And so um, these these things are evolving. Um, but um, we're, we're keen to make this resource collection as useful as possible as we can for you, our members. So, um, yeah, please do send those resources, complete the survey and, and do let us know if there's anything we can be doing to help you navigate. Um, these different materials. Um, so thank you, Natalie. What we'll do, do now until until Sarah is able to join us is we'll actually, I think, just dive right into our panel discussion and, and hear from our panelists um, who are going to highlight some of the key um, guidance, key resources that will be useful for us all at this time. Um, so I'm actually going to be handing back to Natalie um, for a few minutes and just to say, and Natalie leads our work with the Standards and Practice Working Group here at INEE, and she's just got a, a quick update for us um, from um, around the sphere standards. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, I'll keep it quick. I'm sure you're sick of my voice already, um, but putting on my own hat, what I do mostly in my day-to-day -day work other than working with the fabulous standards and practice working group members that Charlotte mentioned um, is keeping an eye on our INEE minimum standards. Um, I know that um, I, I'm not going to do a, a big dive here or a big introduction to the minimum standards. I hope that you are familiar with them. They are our, our kind of foundational flagship tool. Um, I did want to situate INEE's work here in the broader context of humanitarian standards, however. Um, there's already some wonderful guidance available from our peers um, at Sphere as well. Um, you'll hear from Hani in just a few moments speaking on the technical note that they put out around child protection. Um, we're so lucky to be in this humanitarian standards partnership and uh, truthfully, it's been, uh, maybe this is just my, my brain, but I've been very comforted that as a, as a community of humanitarian practitioners, have prioritized having these global frameworks that we can turn to at a time like this. Uh, the purpose of humanitarian standards is to give us um, shared purpose and aspiration and um, guidance at a time like this. So really useful to pick up your minimum standards right now. I suggest it highly if you have not done so yet. Um, but just to say we'll be helping you do that, helping put the minimum standards handbook in your hands at this time in many ways coming up. Um, Sphere is actually publishing, um, republishing their current guidance with um, section signposting uh, parts of humanitarian standards from across the different technical partners. So you'll find a, a wonderful INEE kind of one to two pager there um, coming in the very near future. I promise I'll share that with you as soon as it's available. Um, we're going to expand on that um, in our blog series, the INE blog series and webinar series. There will be a devoted minimum standards um, webinar. Um, and as well, just with, with all of INE's work, uh, we are here. We are so lucky to have a wonderful team and standards and practice, especially um, Charlotte, myself, or uh, our colleague, Benta Sandal Austin. Um, we are always on call for any technical support not just around the minimum standards, but any of INE's tools and resources. Um, and that's where I'll stop for now. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, so actually, I think Sarah may have been able to join us. Um, Sarah, if you are able to speak now, I know you had a few things you just wanted to quickly add. Yeah, hi, Charlotte, can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay, I've joined from my phone. We're going to try this and definitely an example of how I've gotten a lot of feedback from folks on <clears throat> resources for um, low connectivity um, and when connections are not great. Um, so I just wanted to add a, a few um, last things. Probably covered a lot of what um, I was going to cover and just wanted to make a few more points. Um, uh, particularly about um, the languages that the, the lists are available in, they're slightly different for each language. 
um, and our, our um, language community facilitators um, for Arabic, French, Portuguese, and Spanish are um, supporting us in, in curating those lists. Um, so those uh, lists are slightly different, and, and we're hoping um, to provide this webinar um, in some capacity in our other IME languages um, because those lists are slightly different. Um, so feel free to reach out to myself or our language community facilitators um, if you have any questions or specific recommendations for those lists. Um, I also wanted to, to note, and I said this in the chat, that our list of sub-collections is ever-expanding. I added three more last night. Um, it's constantly moving. Um, and again, the goal for these lists is that it's user-friendly. Um, it's that it's easy to digest. I know there's a lot of resources out there, um, which is amazing, but it can be overwhelming. Sometimes I've been more overwhelmed. So the goal is this: the list is is easy for everyone to to use and to understand. So if it's not, please let me know. Give us feedback. Um, the goal is for for all of our members to be able to use it. Um, and so that's why it's constantly updating. As folks folks are asking for specific topics. Um, I know radio education is a big one, so I added that specific list um, last night. So, so please do give us feedback, um, and you can do that via this survey um, or via email. Um, and you can also give us feedback on what resources have been very helpful um, that we can continue to promote. Um, and then the last thing is to, to jump upon um, how we're vetting materials. I know this was a question. Um, that came up beforehand, and Natalie did touch on it. Um, um, as I mentioned, the goal is that it's user-friendly, it's easy to understand, it, it doesn't take a lot to really um, be able to use these resources. Um, and so uh, that's somewhat how we're vetting. Again, if you feel really strongly that a resource should be listed and it's not, and it's very useful, do let us know. Um, so with that, I'll stop um, some of my comments, and again, we'll come back to questions at the end. Um, and again, apologies for the for the audio issue, um, but yeah, we, we'll touch base on questions at the end. And, and as always, feel free to email me um, to our uh, COVID-specific email that goes to me, um, and I'm happy to to continue a conversation further or or send more resources if I'm unable to answer all the questions um, today. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. And yeah, thanks for improvising with the with technology um, and also for all the, the work that's going into the, the collection. So huge thanks. Great. Okay, let's let's move into to our panel discussion now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lisa Bender from UNICEF. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa, who's going to talk to the work UNICEF have been doing and particularly the work they've been doing um, with the World Health Organization and IFCR um, around this. So thank you, Lisa and Hannah, if you want to move to the next slides. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me as a part of the discussion. Um, essentially, UNICEF's been delegated the role as the lead on secondary impacts of the COVID response, um, but we're really moving away from the language of secondary impacts to talk about the direct socioeconomic implications for children around the world, and this makes education very relevant. As noted, um, we've been working very closely with the World Health Organization and the International Federation for the Red Cross and Red Crescent to develop guidance for safe school operations for the prevention and control of COVID-19. This has recently been adopted and endorsed by the Interagency Standing Committee, which we're very pleased about, which means that it's received another round of review and inputs from a number of our UN sister agencies. Um, just briefly, before we go forward, I just want to emphasize that UNICEF is really working closely with governments on planning and response. Um, a big part of our focus will be implementing the Safe Schools guidance, ensuring continuity of learning, and really emphasizing monitoring and evaluation so that we can measure learning outcomes and, and make better decisions about what's working. Um, so we can move to the next slide, please. So the guidance developed again um, was developed with top public health experts. So I do want to reassure everyone that ev all the content has been vetted by resp respiratory health specialists within UNICEF. We had someone seconded from the Centers for Disease Control and work with epidemiologists at the World Health Organization. And um, we also built the guidance off of important 
lessons learned from the Ebola crisis and the Zika crisis, um, understanding how we communicate around public health matters and how education is important in getting life-saving information out to the public and how we adapt education systems within the realities of these um, widespread disease outbreaks. And so um, what we really emphasize is that you cannot use schools for any kind of health purposes as we run into situations where hospitals are overwhelmed and individuals need to be quarantined or first line um, of emphasis is that we cannot use schools for any health purposes. And to really emphasize that education again is a critical space for risk communication and so a direct contribution to stopping the transmission transmission of disease. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to work very closely with our colleagues in water and sanitation, as we know that that's the first line of defense against transmission, um, to work closely with our protection colleagues, as we understand that violence against children and protection concerns increase exponentially in the face of school closures. Um, and so the way that the guidance is, is um, established is that it's really just the key facts. What does everyone need to know? Um, and again, this was vetted with the World Health Organization and our health experts. And then we look at different audiences and say, like, these are the things that we really want you to adopt and understand these key messages. And these are practical actions that you can take in the immediate future to help diminish transmission. For the school environment, we really focus on that environmental health. Um, there's a checklist for school administrators on things they can do to promote environmental health. Um, we have specific messaging for caregivers and parents um, to help amplify those messages that are happening at school and to alleviate anxiety. And then we have a lot of content specifically for children. We really want to frame this response as something that can empower children to take um, responsibility for their own health, but importantly for the health of others and really emphasizing them as agents of, of social change. And we have a number of um, specific um, educational activities for different ages. And I also wanted to share that we're developing supplementary guidance as we speak. Right now, we've just finished protocols for cleaning and disinfecting schools with recommended supplies. And we have an, um, some guidance on expanded guidance on mental health and psychosocial support um, adapted for school contexts. And also, I think what's really helpful is some tips on contextualizing this guidance for different kinds of contexts. Um, and um, thinking about how you can disseminate the guidance, particularly given the restrictions on movement and how to begin implementing the guidance. So we can go on to the next slide. I briefly want to emphasize that UNICEF is really taking an all means all approach and putting equity at the heart of our response. So we're really trying to build upon the lessons from Ebola and Zika to prevent those disproportionate impacts on women and girls. We do not want to contribute to the digital divide. How can we overcome that? Um, and how can we really focus on vulnerable communities like children on the move, um, displaced populations, migrant populations, et cetera. So this is um, really something that's so important to us. And again, the messaging and the framing of the issue around fighting stigma, about building social tolerance, about building compassion are critical social emotional skills that should be at the heart of our response. Uh, we can move to the last slide, please. So practically, in terms of implementing the school guidance, there are a number of steps that we need to, to take, and that means operationalizing the guidance. How do we disseminate and implement the protocols and policies to make this possible? How the financial releases to get supplies that are needed for minimum hygiene packages within schools? How do we translate and adapt and make accessible in all kinds of braille or you know, within um, subtitles and TV for life-saving information? And how do we train teachers, caregivers, and others just provide the critical mental health, psychosocial support, and other services for children. And we really, you know, I think it's just so important to emphasize that this is unprecedented. It's our first pandemic in, in the modern times. However, it's not going to be the last for these children. And so we really have an opportunity to frame them as agents to go forward and, and handle this better in the future. Um, we were asked to keep this to five minutes. I think I'm slightly over, um, so I'm gonna end there, but hope looking forward to questions at the end. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the, the guidance from coming from UNICEF and, and the presentation just now. Um, thanks for everyone submitting questions. We will make sure we get to these, these later on. Um, but I am going to um, now hand over to our colleagues at the, the Global Education Cluster, the Farad and Mackenzie, um, to give us a little bit more detail on, on guidance coming from the cluster as well. Thank you both. 
Hello, thanks so much, um, Charlotte. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you well. Great. So my name is Trod Amundsen. I'm with the Global Education Cluster, and I'm joined uh, by Mackenzie Monterey. And in the next few minutes, we'll update you on key activities that we've done over the past few weeks and the feedback received from the country level. And we'll also be presenting our consolidated COVID-19 resource menu and the dedicated folder on our Box platform. So in terms of the activities and feedback from the country cluster, first, we've had a group calls with the English-speaking and French-speaking clusters and working groups, as well as with our strategic advisory group. And it's been extremely helpful in terms of mapping uh, the country level needs and informing our overall support activities. What we are hearing back from, from, uh, from a lot of the clusters and working groups is that many of them are supporting a Ministry of Education preparedness and response plans in relation to COVID-19. For example, in OPT, the cluster coordinator has been embedded with the Ministry of Education to help with the national response plan. Uh, the, the clusters have also worked very closely in Chad and Car in Iraq with the, the government on the various plans. Secondly, we are hearing that a lot of people from the cluster level and partners are drowning in information and uh, they're requesting clear, practical and to the extent possible contextualized guidance. And Mackenzie will talk a little bit more later on about uh, our resource menu and how we have organized our, our, our information. Uh, the third and big uh, item, which probably has been covered already in the call, is obviously the issue around no or limited connectivity and how this affects distance learning. Internet is not working in many places, unreliable mobile network. Um, and uh, the question then is, of course, how do you maintain a basic numeracy and literacy skills in a period where you can't uh, get any online information, where maybe even radio programming can be limited? So that's a big concern. Um, and what clusters and, and working groups are requesting is very practical guidance on how to, to address this. It's also a, a quite basic problem in terms of coordination with MOEs and, and with partners. Everyone is stranded. Everyone is affected. So how do you hold a virtual meeting when partners don't have access to the internet, for example? Um, and, and I think this is an important point that we have to remember that this is going to affect not only just our response, but the coordination as well. And one example, one suggestion we made to, to the cluster partners is that they might uh, want to at least convene smaller groups, for example, their strategic advisory members for meetings uh, in person, uh, obviously respecting social distances uh, if they have to, uh, but trying to find workarounds in, in, uh, on the lack of, of, uh, of uh, being able to meet in person. And uh, I think the key message coming from the clusters and, and working groups is that we need to really keep it real and practical. Uh, we, they need help with filtering information. And in terms of, of the response that we have holistic needs of families uh, in, in mind, education is obviously one of the issues, but there's other issues as well around well-being, uh, psychosocial support as well. And that we need to re look at interventions at the household level. That leads me to the second main activity that uh, we in the cluster, uh, global education cluster have uh, done over the past week. We have assigned rapid response team members to provide remote support to individual clusters and working groups at an individual level. And uh, they can help with needs assessment, uh, strategic planning, resource mobilization, implementation, and monitoring. And these RRTs also offer an important feedback loop to updating our resource document and the box. Third, our help desk is providing additional remote support and tracking requests from clusters and working groups. So we will be able to report back a little bit more on what we're seeing coming out of, uh, of, the, uh, of the countries. And then fourth and finally, we have uh, today re relaunched our website in a new, totally new design. And it includes important information on our COVID-19 response, but also much improved information and visualization on country data and cluster responses, including toolkit linked to the HCP cycle and, and capacity development. So I think I'll stop there and hand the floor to Mackenzie, who will brief on the, the resource menu and the dedicated COVID folder on our box platform. Over to you, Mackenzie. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to provide some more details on our, our two main resources that the Global Education Cluster um, is providing. Uh, we're focusing our resources, um, their coordination tools. So they're to, to help our clusters and coordination working groups to um, deliver the coordination functions for this COVID response. Uh, we are, we're doing that currently in two main ways. We have a dedicated COVID folder on our box platform, and we also have a consolidated resource menu. 
um, supporting the coordination functions. So this also includes, as Thamrod mentioned, a lot of countries uh, requiring support to, to ministries of education. So the cluster coordinators or working group coordinators will be um, working very closely with the ministry to develop and deliver the national preparedness and response plan. So our tools are very geared toward, toward supporting this coordination. And we refer um, at the top of our guidance note to INEE um, for the technical guidance and resources. And I also mentioned that we link the, the UNICEF, uh, WHO, IFRC, and now IASC endorsed um, tool that Lisa just um, walked us through as well. So for a little bit more detail on the menu, it's currently available in English and French. We're updating it daily um, with new resources to support the, the coordination of the COVID response. It's three pages, so it's very um, short and navigable, and we're maintaining only the key resources there. So as we, as we find more um, relevant or applicable tools, then we're kind of replacing the older ones. Um, but having said that, we have additional resources that are in our box folder, um, both the COVID specific folder as well as linking into our general health emergencies resources. So plenty of um, examples and previous tools from, from the Ebola response as well. Again, these are also mostly coordination focused and national guidance focused. So we structure both the resource menu and the box in a few main categories which are preparedness, response, recovery, and coordination with government. Um, the, the documents that we include are, uh, for example, contingency plans, preparedness planning, and then response, uh, response plan templates. Just to highlight one of our key um, resources, the Global Education Cluster has adapted our response framework template specifically to the COVID response um, so that clusters and working groups can uh, have a go-to template for either adapting their existing strategy or adding a COVID response annex as we know that many many countries um, either through the ministry or through education cannot wait are having to come up with COVID response plans um, and we also have a contextualized response framework design tool to help clusters or working groups think through their response planning. Um, and just a final note on languages, we, as I mentioned, the menu is currently available in English and French. Um, not all of the tools are available in both languages, but in addition, there are some other languages that we have in our, in our box folders, including um, Chinese, Greek, Arabic, Dari, a very some some different languages. So um, we're we're trying to improve the the breadth of languages that we have, um, and also we'll continue to to grow those resources and translate where we can. Over. Wonderful. Thank you um, both so much um, for sharing the details. They're really, really helpful. Um, I'm just going to um, raise one of the questions that has been asked in the in the chat as it's so relevant to this discussion. But it's just a question about how INEE and the, the cluster are, are coordinating and linking um, in terms of our resources. Um, so just, just very quickly on that, just to, to reassure that we are definitely linking up. We're having um, weekly calls, which has been very um, useful, certainly for us at INEE to hear um, to get that insight from country coordinators around um, the needs and the challenges and how we can be most helpful. Um, but Sarah, did you, did you want to jump in and explain a little bit more about how these resource collections are connected? Yeah, thanks Charlotte and um, Throtter McKenzie, feel free to, to jump in as well. Um, yeah, as, as Charlotte mentioned, we are uh, in touch a lot. We're weekly and communicating um, via um, the, the Skype group help desk. Um, I think Paul's note on how um, the cluster's resources are, are focused more um, around coordination is correct. And then um, our list focus more on the technical guidance. We do list coordination resources, um, but it is not as extensive as the clusters. Um, so that is a little bit of a differentiation. But again, if you have questions on um, who has what resource, feel free to reach out to, to either of us. Um, and and we're, both of us are, are happy to help you.
Thanks, Sarah. Um, great. So we'll move on to our, our next panellist. Thank you for all these questions. We are keeping track and we will come to them shortly in the discussion. Um, but Sarah, Sarah Smith joins us um, from IRC. Um, so Sarah, I was wondering, <coughs> excuse me, if you could now speak to um, the practitioner um, perspective um, and, and your work um, in response to this. I'm conscious we have a lot of, lot of colleagues um, working in programming on the line. Um, I'm sure they'd appreciate um, your, your thoughts. Thank you. Of course, thanks Charlotte and Dean and to the whole INE Secretariat and everybody joining today. I know um, these are really challenging times for everybody. So I'm grateful to have a chance to speak to all of you in many corners of, of the world. Um, IRC, like uh, so many NGOs and service providers, is obviously responding in full to this crisis. Um, we only work in crisis-affected contexts, and uh, so crisis is sort of part of our DNA. Um, the map you're looking at shows the countries where IRC works, and I wanted to show it to you simply to emphasize um, how uh, contextual our approach and our response uh, has to be. Um, and also for those of you uh, working in these countries um, to, to share with you where we are so that you can reach out um, because I think uh, working together is really going to be critical. Um, as an organization, uh, the IRC has three organization-wide actions we're taking. Um, the first relates to uh, our staff safety and well-being. Um, promoting our staff safety and well-being is paramount. Uh, we have 14,000 staff around the world and just as many uh, incentive workers and other kinds of staff. Um, they are critical to both uh, responding to this crisis and uh, preventing it. And so we're really very focused on them. Um, the second is program continuity, um, obviously uh, maintaining the life-saving work that we do um, and doing what we can to continue those programs um, is going to be critical. Uh, in education, obviously, uh, very little these days is, is business as usual. Um, and then the third piece of, of the organization-wide response is our, our emergency response. Um, in education, we stood up a, an education um, working group uh, related to the COVID-19 response. Um, it's led by our education and emergencies coordinator and is working hand in hand with our health and protection um, and other sectors teams. Um, we have three pillars to this response. Um, it's the, they are very similar to what others have talked about. Um, the first is around collating and curating materials. The second is around creating new content um, at a local level. And the last is around really building a community and um, support for our, our field colleagues. Um, on the collating and curating um, content, I'll just say that uh, all of the materials that uh, both INEE and the cluster have collated and, and UNICEF's content um, has been really impressive. So we're just focused on pushing things out um, to our field staff and making sure that they have access and that they uh, know where to find things. Um, as we've heard, uh, a lot of information uh, is overwhelming for folks, so we're trying to just make sure they know where it is um, and how to access it. Um, we've also heard a lot um, in this conversation about how many of the resources are um, uh, they're growing at a, a fast rate, but much of it can be very text heavy, um, not multilingual or not in languages that um, are, are perhaps um, more local languages. And uh, there's a growing amount, but, but not enough content that's very useful for children and their busy and overwhelmed uh, caregivers. Um, we know uh, from other crises and particularly public health crises that communities are really at the center of this. Um, they're at the center of both prevention and response. So our work is very much at the community level, um, trying to get content translated into even the most um, 
uh, far-reaching uh, languages and contextualizing uh, con global content uh, so that it really resonates um, with very local, local communities. Um, also making sure that uh, content is in small bite-sized pieces that can be easily digested um, and that it's uh, useful for um, children specifically, um, but also caregivers and educators. Uh, because we have such a, a large workforce of educators and are connected to so many um, teachers, both government and non-governmental teachers, um, having resources for them is really important. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, um, there's been talk in this conversation about contexts where there is limited connectivity. Um, so uh, we have also been part of uh, other groups that's pulling radio-based content. We'll also be creating new radio-based content and also um, focused on using platforms like WhatsApp um, and uh, other platforms that pull together WhatsApp groups so that WhatsApp can be used very easily um, across uh, uh, groups of, of educators and caregivers. Um, and then lastly, because so many of our staff are running programs, um, existing programs, we're also just helping them with um, adapting those programs and doing scenario planning. We're seeing that most countries, um, depending on their country's school calendars, um, have three kinds of scenarios. One is that schools reopen um, in several months and uh, go back to um, let's hope business as usual. Second is schools open in several months, um, but they uh, have an adjusted curriculum, a catch-up curriculum. Um, and the last scenario um, is that schools stay pro closed for a prolonged period of time. So we're planning programs across all three of those uh, possible scenarios and helping staff um, think about what uh, they can do um, depending on those scenarios. Um, so just I'll close to thank again, <clears throat> excuse me, INEE and everybody um, in this webinar. Um, I think uh, it's moments like this that uh, I think we see the importance of a community like INEE um, in the midst of these kinds of challenges and uncertainties. Um, seeing a convening of hundreds of people devoted to educating kids who are usually the ones left behind. Um, it's extraordinary, it's inspiring, and it's where we should all find hope. Um, these kinds of crises can bring us closer together, uh, even if not physically. Um, and I think that's when uh, lasting change will really, really happen. So thanks again to everybody. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, really important and powerful reflections, um, but also kind of, yeah, appreciate that hopeful message to end with as well. Um, again, brilliant questions coming in, which we will follow up with the panelists. Um, um, but I am now going to turn to our colleagues from the Child Protection Alliance. Um, so Hani joins us now. I think, you know, we are all very committed to a close collaboration between um, education emergencies and child protection. But I think particularly now we see additional challenges. We know that with school closures often come increased um, child protection concerns. So um, particularly important, I think, to be having, having this discussion today. So thanks for joining us, Hani. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. I'm going to put my video on as uh, suggested. Um, great to be here among education colleagues. Um, I, I should feel a bit out of, out of place, but I don't because we've been working with INE and many of you for the past three years. And, uh, and the fact that INE invited us to join this webinar really suggests the dedication that exists both from our side, but also from um, INE side in making sure that child protection and education go hand in hand in, um, when, in situations like this, in situations of emergencies and humanitarian context. Um, the Alliance is, uh, just for you to, to know briefly, is a, is a very similar, has a very similar uh, structure and setup to INE. Um, but for the child protection sector. So we are a network of organizations that come together to work on technical uh, issues and advocacy. Um, and when COVID-19 um, happened, and it's, it, even before it was called a pandemic, but it looked like it's going to become a pandemic, uh, we um, 
shifted into 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 gear and started working with our with our members and colleagues um, to produce necessary material that um, can help um, our child protection actors in um, in uh, responding to what seems at least on the on the face of it as a very um, un, as an unknown or or a um, atypical emergency um, or, or a humanitarian situation. If you can go forward on the slides, please. Or do I have control? Uh, one more, please. Great, so just a brief overview. Um, after the Ebola crisis in 2014-15 in West Africa, um, the Alliance, or actually during the Ebola crisis, we were faced with this um, with this challenge of, um, of not really being able to, to do a lot of um, child protection interventions that we typically do. Um, therefore, once we had, um, we were past the, the Ebola crisis in 2016, we started working on a, on a guidance note on protection of children during infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and we brought in learning from um, Ebola, from uh, MERS, SARS, um, cholera outbreaks, and put them together in a, in a document to help practitioners have a better idea of how to adapt programming to these to these situations. When COVID nineteen happened, we um, we again uh, felt um, the need to adapt that guidance note to a much shorter version um, that is also very specific to COVID nineteen. If you can go forward, please. Um, so this is the general structure of the technical go note that we. Um, we produced, I'm not gonna go into details of it, but I'm gonna point out that section under section two, um, there is a subsection 2.1 where we specifically address the issue of working with um, other sectors. And in that, there's a whole section on working with education, which also resonates with um, our standard 23, if I remember correctly, from the minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action, which talks about collaboration across the two sectors. Um, if you can go forward, please. So the whole, uh, maybe one more, just to save time, I'm not gonna go through all of it. Um, yes, please. So um, one of the things that, that kind of made us uh, or prompted us to make sure that we have a section on um, working with other sectors, including education, is this diagram that came out of the, the joint uh, meeting that we had with INE um, back in 2018 in, uh, in Nairobi, where I currently sit, um, where there was this suggestion that we should kind of change a bit our, our thinking in terms of how, do we, how, how we respond to, to emergency situations and, and to, to the well-being of the child, rather than thinking, starting from thinking um, about our, our um, sectoral outcomes, which might be for us, it might be prevention of exploitation and abuse, for education might be educational outcomes. Um, rather, let's start from the, the well-being of the child. And I want to posit that if, if that if we all, not just child protection and education, but also WASH and health, start from that that point and really think about how how is the well-being of children um, affected in this in this particular crisis. Um, and if that's a starting point, then collaboration just becomes a natural outcome of it. Um, in that, if a child is out of school, it's not that they're just not getting the education that they should be getting, but they're also potentially at much higher risk of all sorts of um, um, adversities, including violence, including abuse, including neglect, maltreatment, um, high, higher stress among caregivers. Um, you must have seen there is article after article that is coming out showing how levels of abuse and, and um, violence even within homes are increasing. Um, there was an article a few days ago about two cases of, um, of death of children due to uh, severe abuse um, that is linked directly to, uh, at least the article suggests that it's linked directly to the impact of uh, of uh, um, Corona, sorry, I wanted to say Ebola. Um, so, kind of looking looking at that as as a mixed bag of of all sorts of negatives that can come out of the um, 
not, not just the virus itself, but also the containment measures, measures that are put in place. And then it m kind of follows more, more um, um, directly that child protection has a, has a role to play, education has a role to play, and all the other sectors have, have roles to play. And only together, we will be able to ensure that child well-being and healthy development is, is assured. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, thanks. Um, so yes, I actually, Dean mentioned that uh, 1.2 billion, I think I, I just saw on the Education Cannot Wait website, 1.38 billion children are out of school. And it's, while it's a really terrible piece of data, um, it also provides opportunities in, um, in making sure that we, uh, we work together in delivering the much needed services that children children um, need at this at this very critical moment um, they're at home they are not they're, they they don't they don't need one thing or the other they need a package of of services um, one thing that we keep bringing up as a contribution that we can help with education online education and, and remote education is making sure that within the education material that is being put out for example we make sure that there are elements that support children in um, safeguarding their well-being, um, their psychosocial health, their uh, if if they are being abused or violated, um, what kind of resources they they have in their access, what what where they can go and how they can um, access services, um, and the fact that education is is such an established uh, demand within the population kind of makes education a a, a great conduit to make sure that we. Um, we we kind of work um, through education on general well-being of children. Uh, these are just some examples. I don't have I don't have a lot of time, so um, of of opportunities that exist for us to to work with each other. Um, one thing that I want to specifically highlight is the issue of families. Um, we in child protection are increasingly in the past decade working with families as a means to to protect and support children. Um, and I think this particular moment is, is a moment where together with the education colleagues, we need to focus more and more on our families and communities um, as was also mentioned earlier. Um, I'll, I have a bunch more to say, but you will receive the, um, receive the slides. I won't go much further because I know there's not much time left uh, for Q&A, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Hani, and yeah, definitely look forward to, to collaborating um, even more moving forward. Um, so thank you to all our panelists. We now have 30 minutes left of the webinar, um, which is hopefully a good amount of time um, for discussion as there are some um, really important questions being raised in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Um, just to say, we will try to get to as many as we can. If we, if we do run out of time, we will follow up. We've just been having a, a side chat about potential um, FAQ document, but also um, more, more direct follow-up as needed. We will also be organising a series of webinars around specific topics. So some of the issues that you arrange, um, have raised in the, in the chat, we will hopefully be able to, to organise some targeted webinars focusing, focusing on those. Um, so, so we'll provide more information of that shortly. Um, but if I could just ask um, Hannah, if you can stop sharing your screen now and if perhaps ask the panellists to, to come on video um, and um, we'll put some of these, these important questions to you now. Um, I'll, uh, so yeah, we've got Sarah, Hani, Tarad, and hopefully Lisa is still with us. Um, can't see you, Lisa, but hopefully you're there. Um, so we'll just, I mean, one of the, the questions we had from several people before the webinar was really asking for advice um, for education actors around how they can better link with different sectors. Um, so child protection, as we've just heard, but also health and WASH colleagues. Um, so it'd be great to hear from you, Lisa, if you are still on, uh, any, any reflections there, given the close collaboration you're already undertaking. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to strengthen systems and build back better. 
we've been having a lot of discussions about that. I mean, what better time to have a major investment in hand washing and in sanitation and gender separate toilets in schools than this public health emergency, which will mobilize resources that we generally don't have access to within the education sector. So that's a critical way in which we are advancing both gender equality, girls education, water sanitation with our WASH colleagues. Um, I don't think I can add anything of value after that comprehensive overview from Honey, but the child protection um, opportunities are also very present. And as I noted before, this opportunity to work with our public health um, experts and to really emphasize the necessity of risk communication for slowing the transmission of disease, preventing it and controlling outbreaks, um, schools are a critical avenue for that and even where schools are closed ensuring that any radio education television online sources include those life-saving health behaviors is so critical and so working with our health experts to ensure that we're basing our messages on the latest um, medical science and research is critical as well as ensuring that that again that information is as accessible and adapted as needed to reach the largest audiences um, and I wanted to make a plug for the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience in the Education Sector they're also going to be putting together a series of webinars and what our discussion has been has been that you know around the comprehensive school safety framework that many of the existing EIE frameworks are very applicable even to public health emergencies. We're looking at infrastructure, we're looking at management policies, we're looking at teacher support. So I wouldn't feel overwhelmed that this is a new or different kind of crisis. Many of the tools and approaches we've been using are still going to be very successful in, in having um, effective responses to this pandemic. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, yeah, really, really helpful, comprehensive response there. Thank you. Hani, anything to add? I know you've already touched on this in your presentation, but anything you'd add from um, the, your perspective? I mean, I, it's, on, it's really just reiterating on that aspect of uh, ensuring that our, our starting point is analyzing what are the elements of this pandemic that are affecting, negatively affecting the well-being of children and start from there building up the responses. And that naturally will bring in all of these elements of um, WASH and child protection and education and others. So um, I won't repeat more of what I said, but I think it's uh, that shift of mentality is probably what, uh, what needs to take place um, for, for this to become effective. Great, thank you so much, Hani. Okay, I'm gonna to move to our second question. And I have to say, this is the question that we've been hearing most frequently, both before the webinar and during it. Um, and this is this question around distance learning um, and uh, thinking about how there are lots of school closures happening at the moment and that's led to this discussion about online solutions, but how do we support distance learning in low resource and low tech environments, which so often we're working in, in EIE. So how can we guarantee an EIE response to the most vulnerable populations who don't have that same access to the internet or electronic devices? Um, so I know um, a few of you mentioned already that sort of the digital divide, equity concerns, but it would be great to hear some reflections for the participants around um, remote learning in these contexts. Um, Sarah, I wonder if we could come to you to you first for some reflections there. I know you touched on it in your presentation. Sure. Yeah, it's the, the question of the day. And I think those of us who are our parents, even with uh, great connectivity, um, we're all struggling uh, to um, provide learning for children um, while doing a million other things. And I'm uh, not nearly as overwhelmed as most of our, our clients out there. Um, so uh, I, I think we've all talked about radio. Radio is going to be critical. It's been critical in other crises. Um, uh, in, in the Ebola crisis, it was very helpful um, for communities. Um, I think that really trying to, and I think, honey, you alluded to this, but take a very ground up approach to um, thinking about how we disseminate content. Communities and teachers and parents, they will, um, they'll find ways. Uh, and so it's about taking what's global and making it very accessible um, for, uh, for those um, communities. And they're all gonna be different and have different needs. Um, so, you know, using uh, networks of teachers, um, 
who are very connected. We have lots of uh, teacher WhatsApp groups, even um, where there's very little uh, connectivity, teachers communicate with each other by WhatsApp um, very effectively. And I think that um, is going to be a, a critical platform. So not giving them entire manuals via WhatsApp, but very small pieces of information that they can then adapt themselves. They're creative people and they will um, make them useful for uh, for their the families that they're working with and supporting um, and realizing how trusted teachers are um, they're often the ones who uh, are are the most trusted in a community so um, relied on for for that kind of information um, I also think that um, integrating uh, learning social emotional learning in particular into other services where we know kids are accessing um, so we know that um, children will continue to go to water points or they'll continue to go um, to health facilities and tr offering educational content um, that is simple and easy to access into those other services is also going to be um, critical and adapting content so that it can be used within a WASH program, within a, a community health program um, is another approach we're taking. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and Lisa, is there anything you'd add to that from um, your perspective at UNICEF? Yeah, I would just add that um, to build on the point I made previously that we can use a lot of the models that we're using in other crises right now. Um, you know, based on the specific risk factors in each location, for instance, in Cameroon, where schools have literally been closed for years, we've started small learning circles where teachers or trained individuals are able to do home visits um, so as not to raise concerns around starting education, putting children at risk, um, and these small home visits are able to serve as tutoring sessions to help children ensure that they're progressing with their studies. Um, and we're also looking at television in areas where that's a possibility. And the great thing about television is it means that we can include sign language and, and other things to make it a bit more accessible. So I think that the biggest thing is, as Sarah said, is building on the innovations that are happening on the ground and to do what you can now and let that build over time is, is, as opposed to feeling paralyzed by needing to find a perfect solution. Even here in New York City, in one of the richest cities in the world, we're really having difficulty in launching remote learning so this is a process that we're all in together. Yeah, thanks so, so much, Lisa. Yeah, really important, important message there. Um, and just to say, everyone, that we, we really recognise that this is the, the key question, as Sarah said, um, facing many of us right now. So we will be, we will be holding a webinar dedicated to this topic um, specifically, um, and we hope to get the invitation to you out, um, very soon. Um, and get a date for that as we, we do appreciate that the, yeah, the more practical strategies that we can share and build on um, the better um, for the community. So um, yeah, more on that soon. Um, another question um, that a few people have raised has been around what lessons have been learned from previous pandemics and, and health crises. And I think, you know, we've heard mention of the Ebola response a couple of times um, today. Um, so I just wanted to hand over to our colleagues at the cluster, um, maybe just for a brief update on some thinking that's being done about that at the moment. Sure, so I'll be, I'll be very brief, but we have uh, our strategic advisory group who uh, has taken the initiative to, um, to convene a call, it's not been decided when it will happen, to reflect on lessons from, from the Ebola response and, uh, and convene a broader discussion on that. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of meetings and calls and uh, discussions going on, but, uh, but, the, but the strategic advisory group last week said that that's something that they would like to do, um, working with people who are, who are intimately involved in the, um, in the response in West Africa back in 2014, and, uh, and look at not just preparedness and response, but as we have discussed uh, today as well on, on recovery, uh, which is obviously more than the longer term uh, focus that also needs to, to take place. Um, Mackenzie, do you want to add anything? No, just on the recovery point, this was one of the the things we've been hearing from from Ebola response is that we're we have a lot of focus on on preparedness and on response, and then we're so busy responding that um, the recovery takes us by surprise. And when schools open again, um, that's not uh, done in such an organized way. So um, 
know, knowing that that's coming, it's something that we can start thinking about ahead of ahead of the school reopening and, and something that we're supporting uh, the country clusters in their work with the ministries to, to think ahead on that. Great, thanks so much Mackenzie. And I think that, that already speaks to another question that's come up quite a few times. So um, yeah, thank you for, for raising that point. Um, and we'll be sure to share um, what comes out of that conversation around those lessons learned from the Ebola response um, via INE. So as soon as we have um, more on that, we'll be definitely be circulating that. And in the meantime, we're on the INE side, we're certainly trying to, to locate as much as we can um, from previous experiences. Um, so more on that soon, um, but thanks for that great question. Um, so another question related to this, the challenge of, of now movement is restricted. Um, both in terms of traveling to different contexts, but also within within country. Um, and so the question is really, how can we continue to build capacity of local partners and teachers um, remotely so that they can effectively deliver education under these circumstances? Um, so Sarah, perhaps coming back to you again for any thoughts on that. I know kind of we've talked about remote learning, but what about that capacity building piece? Yeah, I, I don't know um, uh, if, I have too much more to add on this, but I do think that um, uh, INE is a perfect example of how we can rethink uh, um, community and networks. Um, I think uh, capacity building is essentially about um, building community and help having people um, uh, help each other, uh, strengthen each other's skills. As Lisa mentioned, in, in all kinds of crises, uh, we have um, uh, uh, local um, solutions that, such as uh, having teachers um, convene in very small groups and learn from each other, share practices from each other, um, having uh, people who are training each other, or building each other's capacity, uh, be able to do so at a very a localized level, I think is going to be um, critical. Uh, using any form of technology, obviously, um, that is available is going to, um, can be quite helpful. Um, but I, I can't emphasize enough um, our colleagues saying that it's really about making the, the product, the content itself, um, extremely easy for, for people to use, and then they'll use it, adapt it, and learn from each other. Um, so, you know, continuing to emphasize uh, those small groups. I'll also say um, just one thing on the Ebola point. We've also heard a lot from um, our health colleagues and others about um, misinformation and how misinformation um, can really set back a, um, a, a community as far as um, its ability to, to prevent um, a, a crisis of any kind, but especially a public health one. And so as much as we can now, uh, especially in places where um, this pandemic hasn't hit as hard, um, prevent misinformation and use these local networks um, to, to put out um, accurate fact-based information, um, that is gonna be really critical. And it's a lesson we, we learned, um, I hope we can learn from, from the Ebola crisis. Thanks so much, Sarah. Anyone, any of the other panelists want to speak to that point around capacity building um, in these circumstances? Please feel free um, yeah, to jump this in. Is Lisa, if I could just come in briefly, I wanted to talk about UNICEF and Microsoft partnership around a new online platform called Learning Passports. Um, we're getting ready to launch it in a number of countries and um, it's a self-learning platform and, and we're struggling with the same question of how are we going to get instructors and trainers on the ground prepared to utilize the platform. And what we're really doing is moving towards video orientation. So this is um, either through video calls, but then taking the best of those trainers and having them produce their own video videos. So they're also learning by doing, by creating content that that's then going to go out to our instructors in the field. Um, and so this is one way that we're trying to remotely support capacity building for our teachers and trainers. And another thing we're trying to do is to produce um, like comic style videos that can easily be voiced over in different languages um, to be accessible to um, more um, linguistic minority communities and, and things like that. So those are just some small practical things we're taking forward currently. 
Great, thanks, Lisa. It's um, yeah, it's it's inspiring to hear about these these creative ideas and also the opportunity to share existing ideas as well. So so thanks um, for those reflections. Um, we're getting um, Sarah Montgomery. We've had quite a few um, questions specific to the collection. So in particular, whether you are um, seeing that there are tools and resources available to support families um, with children with special needs. Um, and um, we've also had quite a few questions today in the chat about supporting children with disabilities. So any, would it be possible to share whether we have got um, tools and resources available in the collection currently? Um, and then just the second question has been around child-friendly resources and whether um, we have um, those as well in the collection. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak uh, first to the child-friendly resources. We have a specific list of child-friendly resources and I will um, link that in um, the chat box momentarily. Um, in terms of um, inclusion and resources for students with disabilities um, and parents, um, Starting to see more, we do have um, an inclusion list that I'm hoping to populate with more resources. Um, there is some guidance around it, um, but if folks have, have resources that they've used, please um, pass them along. Um, and I really hope to, to continue to, to populate um, that list with more specific resources on um, education for students with, with disabilities. Most of the guidance is more general of, of how to um, support um, those um, with disabilities in the response in general. Um, I don't know if any of our panelists have come across anything specifically, um, but I will definitely keep my eye out and update that list um, as soon as I see other resources. Thanks for that, Sarah. And, and just to say again to, to participants that um, given this is and it's such an emerging need, um, we will also factor this into the webinar planning and, and we'll plan to do a, a dedicated webinar as well. Um, and the other, the other thing I've seen come up a few times is the impact of this on um, women and girls in particular. And, and again, we'll, we'll try and make sure we have dedicated webinars on these, these issues that, that are emerging in, in so many of the contexts in which we're working. Um, so thanks um, everyone for, for flagging those issues. Also just another uh, quite a specific question for cluster colleagues around how to access um, the, the box resources. We will be sharing the, the PowerPoints um, and the recording after the webinar, but, webinar, but Thorod, Mackenzie, anything just to say practically about how people can access these, these resources? Um, the, the links are on the PowerPoint to both the box folder for COVID-19 and the resource menu. And the resource menu contains tons of hyperlinks um, either to external resources um, or to documents within our own box. And those are updated um, regularly, so the links remain live. Yeah, just to quickly add as well that there will uh, also be links on our website to which, um, which is imminent. I mean, it's going to come up in the next few hours or so. Over. Great, thanks both. Um, so the next question, and again, this is a concern that's been raised by a lot of colleagues, um, is really around the well-being of staff at this time. Um, we know it's sort of an, it's such an important issue always, but particularly with staff dealing with sort of their own concerns, concerns for their families at the moment. Um, and Hani, I just wondered if we could come to you for any reflections about how we can support well-being of our staff at this time. Yes, thanks, Charlotte. Um, I mean, a few, a few things on that. Um, one is I, I feel like the more you can use this opportunity of, um, of almost a slowdown in the activities of, of teachers um, to, to engage them as an active participant to what is happening, rather than letting them be like many, many other, uh, others, uh, a passive kind of observant of, okay, schools are closed now, I'm sitting at home, waiting for this to pass and then dealing with all the issues that that they they have at home as well so community building as sarah sarah said i think is a is a huge and and i &E is very good at it so making sure that you have potentially all of the local uh, kind of branches of of I &E, making sure that they're connected to all the to all the teachers so they have a, they have a way of exchanging um, and feeling like they're doing something simple things, simple messages like, 
record something for your students and send them send it to them via WhatsApp, of course, if you have access to to internet. But as um, um, I don't remember who was mentioning that WhatsApp is a, is is relatively available in in many many contexts and short videos can um, so basically getting getting them to be an active part of this I think is already one step towards uh, ensuring their mental health uh, misinformation which again was mentioned I think is a is a huge huge part of this and again I E can play a role in making sure that you are disseminating the right information so that they're um, they're uh, they're not scared um, and um, and are using information that are not accurate. Um, advocacy at the at the country level to make sure that they actually are allowed to have flexible working arrangements, especially those that have their own children and are and are uh, are in need of um, or don't have any any kind of care arrangements. Um, and also, the last thing I would say is ensuring that um, that those that are at higher higher risk so those with those older um, teachers and also those with pre-existing conditions are not uh, forced to go in, in places where schools are are open forced to go to school or when schools start opening they should not be the first ones that go back just uh, just to make sure that their their health is not uh, put at risk so kind of almost uh, I know it can even sound like a discriminatory structure but making sure that those that are younger and um and healthier are the ones that um that are responding to um or are active in education when risk are, are, risk is still high so those are a few points that i thought i would share thank you so much honey um and yeah just to reiterate to colleagues that there will be a webinar next week dedicated to this this issue of um staff well-being as we know, it's sort of a, a, a critical one. Um, as Dean mentioned at the start of the webinar, I know many of you in your work are supporting others and, and dedicated to doing that. So what, what can we be doing to support each other and take care of ourselves at this time? Um, thanks, honey. And you also kind of brought up that critical issue of teachers. And again, we've had many questions of this. Um, we've been talking about it as I and E about this sort of, there seems to be this realization um, at the moment of just quite the unique role teachers play in society and, and the burdens on them are, are increasing. Um, so what can we be doing at that time to, to really support our teachers and um, particularly um, through in remote ways at the moment. Um, so again, we will be hosting a, a dedicated webinar around support to teachers um, both, their, both their well-being and their professional de um, development as well. Okay, thank you so much to all our panelists. I'm really conscious that we are nearly at time now for the webinar. Um, before we sort of bring things to a close, did, did any of the panelists, is there anything you wanted to raise that you haven't had chance to? Um, please do jump in if so. No? Okay, well, just, just to say a huge thanks to all of you for sharing the guidance and um, as well as your reflections in the discussion. And to say to our participants a huge, huge thanks. Um, I am conscious there are many more questions that we didn't cover in our 30 minute discussion. And um, please know that we will be following up with you on those questions. Um, and so we hope to, to have more um, detailed responses with you soon and we'll touch base with the panelists as well. Um, and we'll also share more detail of those other webinars in a blog series that will be shared soon as well to support all of your efforts in education in emergencies. Um, we thank you for everything you are doing and here at i &E, we will just keep continuing to try and bring conversations together to create the space um, people need at the moment to, to come together to discuss challenges but also to find the practical solutions together. Um, so a huge thanks. Um, Dean, did you, is there anything you want to share before, before we wrap up the conversation? Uh, just thank you everyone. I know many, you know, we had more than 700 people register for this uh, event and unfortunately we didn't have the capacity for everyone. So we will share this straight afterwards so you can give this to your colleagues uh, so they could also listen in. Um, but thank you so much to our distinguished panelists um, taking time out um, in, in these very busy times. Uh, and thank you to the INE team. Please stay tuned uh, for further webinars. Uh, we will also be um, doing our best to address the many, many questions uh, that have come to us. Uh, please take care, stay safe, stay home, <laughs> stay well, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, everyone. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you.